biomechanical analysis of the clean and jerk. The clean and jerk is an explosive movement used to train athletes' ability to be both powerful and strong via the use of resistance training methods. The movement is defined as an Olympic movement pattern and is scored as an Olympic movement at an Olympic movement weightlifting events. Therefore, the correct form associated with the clean and jerk has been thoroughly scrutinized and developed by not only the general strength and conditioning industry, but also by the Olympic Weightlifting Committee as well. The clean and jerk is normally broken down into seven very different and distinct phases. The first pull phase, the transition or scoop phase, the second pull phase, the catch phase, which will end with the presentation of the weight in the stance position. The jerk will begin with the dip phase, then it will go to the drive phase, and finish again with a catch phase, finalizing the jerk position. Within each of these sections, there are very defined guidelines related to the form and movement patterns that need to be adhered to in order to maximize production and minimize risk of injury. We'll begin this biomechanical breakdown of the clean and jerk first by breaking down the clean. We'll start with the first pull or the first phase of the clean, which should begin with the shoulder slightly in front of the bar while the athlete maintains a weight balance of approximately 60-40 with a heel to ball of foot ratio. The pull will begin with a slight rise of the shoulders as the bar lifts off the ground. The athlete's goal is to keep it as close to the shins as possible. This is of course in an effort to maximize mechanical advantage of the body at that moment over the barbell. As the bar lifts off the ground, the stomach is hollowed out and the lumbar and mid-thoracic spine are stabilized and rigid. A deep breath and the use of the Valsalva maneuver will help maintain a rigid midline by creating a diaphragmatic block. Once the hips begin to rise, the athlete will begin contracting with the hamstrings and glutes predominantly. In order to work on the first pull, a strength and conditioning coach will likely have the individual complete several different training movements that replicate the movement pattern necessary to complete a proper first pull. The majority of these movement drills will likely focus on the posterior chain development of the leg and hip region of the body. There will be an enormous focus on maintaining speed while never compromising location of bar, bar path, and overall form cues. Some of the drills that the strength and conditioning coach will likely have their athlete complete are as follows. Traditional deadlift, focusing on shoulders over the bar, Romanian deadlift, focusing on squeezing through the glutes, and a banded first pole training drill, focusing on the speed fast, of course, first with the concentric movement, and then slow and controlled with a focus of an eccentric movement downward of the first pole. Next, we will focus on the second phase, which is the scoop or transition phase. It is defined as the, move, as the moment the bar crests the knee joint and begins the upward movement towards the hips. This phase is important because it poses a, possesses a double knee bend per se. Once the bar crosses the knee joint, the hamstrings and glutes begin to fire even greater as they approach full hip extension. However, just before the full extension of the hip joint, there is a small eccentric knee flexion to allow maximum force when extending and tight bar path as the barbell crests the knee joint. Without this phase, the mechanical advantage would be compromised and the likelihood of the athlete achieving the lift will probably drop. The training of this section is not very well documented with regards in to tr resistance training methods due to the shortness of the movement pattern during this phase. However, the strength and conditioning coach will likely use some variations of pulls to train this section, although the likelihood is that the coach will combine their efforts of training this transition phase with the training of the second pull or first pull phase. The next phase we will describe is the third phase of the clean or the second pull phase. At this point the athlete will be achieving what's called triple extension. This is the full extension of the ankles, knees, and hips during the second pull phase. This triple extension is what makes the power clean movement so explosive and so closely related to athletic movements requiring hip explosion. Therefore, it is when the athlete finally achieves triple extension that they complete their final concentric pull action of this movement. At the point of the second pull, the athlete will also represent a shrug of the shoulders as the elbows remain fully extended. 
This causes a huge energy transfer in the upward or vertical plane, allowing the bar to travel up the body in an aggressive, smooth manner. This phase can be trained independently by several other exercise techniques in an effort to maximize its potential for force slash power production. From this point on, other than the transition from the bottom of the catch in the deep squat clean or the small extension phase after a catch during a traditional power clean, the concentric movements are primarily done and it is the eccentric strength of the body that will finish the movement pattern. The strength coach will likely have several training exercises to specifically train this phase. Some are the clean pulls, high pulls, and jump shrugs. The fourth and final phase of the clean is called the catch phase. This phase can either be completed in the bottom of what looks like a front squat or at the top of what looks like a quarter front squat. The depth of the movement will likely be dependent on the load of the bar and the necessity to drop underneath the weight. If the weight is on the heavier side, let's say greater than 70% of the athlete's one rep max, the athlete will likely use a squat clean method so that the third phase, the second pull, does not have to be as high, thus causing the athlete to have to drop lower to get underneath the bar in time. During this phase, the bar will actually become weightless for a moment as the direction of force by the athlete changes from a concentric pull to an eccentric catch. During this catch phase, it is so important to possess enough mid-thoracic mobility to maintain parallel elbows with the floor so that the athlete can keep the center of gravity or force over the hips rather than over the feet, which would eventually cause the athlete to draw forward. The eccentric motion and parallel front rack are incredibly important to train and can be greatly improved by specific exercises and movement patterns that mimic those movement patterns. Some of the exercises that could help with this are the front squat, especially in a tempo-based method, high hang drop catches, and front rack liftoffs. Next onto the jerk. The first phase of the jerk movement is started with what's called a dip or dip phase. The dip resembles a quarter front squat with the bar resting across the clavicle region and the anterior deltoids as the athlete eccentrically descends into the bottom part of the dip. The athlete is generating negative velocity by using the dip and relying on the absorption capabilities of the body to retransfer that energy when the athlete starts the upward movement against the bar. This movement is short, concise, and, and efficient in order to produce the correct energy transfer upon the bar. If the movement is too low, it will require too much energy to transfer the weight back up in the positive vertical direction, thus cutting down on the velocity needed to move the bar. Therefore, practicing to understand where the athlete's true ideal depth is could be essential to the correct performance of the jerk press movement. Some exercises that the athlete can work on in order to improve the dip section of their jerk press would be the front rack work, either banded or unbanded, with a load. The next phase of the jerk is the second phase, which is called the drive phase. This is an explosion against the bar that generally causes the athlete to leave the ground. This is perhaps the largest force generated by the athlete throughout the entire clean and jerk movement. It is here that the athlete will experience a bar that for one very moment feels relatively weightless until caught in the next phase. As the energy is transferred upon the bar, the athlete will leave the ground and land in what looks like a split squat or lunge position, which would finish in the next phase called the catch. Exercises that the athlete can use to work on the drive phase would be strict press, dip press, dip jerk, overhead lunge, or overhead Bulgarian lunge. The third and final phase of the jerk press would be the catch phase. Like the catch phase of the clean and jerk, the catch phase of the jerk press will require a significant amount of eccentric power to be able to absorb the load of the bar and then use some concentric power to be able to stand up and present the weight from there. The movement pattern requires incredible mid-thoracic and lumbo-hip mobility as well as significant midline stabilization in order to maintain a rigid spine as the bar is held overhead. Now that we have discussed a brief description of the clean and jerk, we will go over the purpose or goal of performing this clean and jerk. It is basically to improve the athlete's potential to generate both force and power. 
This is accomplished by constantly varying the load of resistance and making sure the athlete greatly understands the necessary path of the bar and the necessary movement patterns needed to complete this movement. Bar path efficiency, as stated earlier, is so vastly important so that the coach can ensure the athlete's peak potential for power is being achieved while minimizing the athlete's risk of injury at the same time. Since athletics can literally be defined as the combination of form, coordination, and power, the element of power and form repetition can be incredibly important to the potential for athletic development. From a biomechanical viewpoint, the goal of the power clean is to have the athlete maximize their mechanical advantage at each joint during the movement and to understand how to transfer energy from the floor through the hips to the shoulders and hands. In addition, throughout the power clean, the element will the athlete will also learn how to absorb energy during the catch phases, which as we know, the absorption or lack of ability to absorb energy can result in detrimental injuries to the athlete. When observing an athlete perform a power clean and jerk, I would generally observe one athlete at a time, and the relative environment influence would therefore be low. Some external and internal influences that might play a factor in the success of the movement would be the surface in which the athlete is completing the action, the current fatigue level of the athlete, the amount of external load that is on the barbell, and then finally the trained level of the athlete. When observing the first phase or the first pull, we start with looking at the proper stance, which should be feet no more than shoulder width apart, hands in a pronated locked grip format just outside the feet, elbows fully extended, feet grounded in a 60-40 ratio, the shoulders slightly in front of the knees, the stomach hollowed out with a rigid lumbar and thoracic spine, the knees slightly varus over the pinky toes, and the head placed in a neutral position. During the first pull, nothing really changes from the stance phase in terms of positioning of the joints or body segments. However, in terms of a movement, a large intake of air is inhaled and held so that the rigidness of the lumbar, abdomen, and thoracic spine can be maintained throughout the movement pattern. In addition, the initial movement of the body actually begins with the shoulders as they initiate the rise of the bar against the vertical shins. As the bar begins to rise, the hips will begin shortly after the shoulders as they fly up to allow the beginning of hip extension during the upward movement phase of the bar. As the hips rise, the hamstrings will be put under tremendous pressure and asked to concentrically contract so that the hips can begin to extend. In terms of range of motion this, of this phase, the ankles, knees, hips, and even the shoulders all begin to extend and will climax their extension during the third phase. In terms of velocity and acceleration, we will notice a slower movement speed due to the increased force applied to the body from the load of the bar. This slower speed will also allow the body to minimize any deficiencies in bar path during the initial pull. As stated earlier, the timing in relation to which body part moves first is key to the proper movement pattern taking place. If the hips rise before the shoulders begin a pull or rise, the likelihood is that the athlete will fall towards their heels and miss the lift or need to compromise later movement patterns in order to correct the form or bar path. When observing the second phase, we're really just focusing on the bar path once again as we transition from cresting the knees to now pulling towards full hip extension. The main focus here is to make sure that the bar stays close to the body. In terms of raising range of motion of this phase, all extension phases, hips, knees, ankles, and shoulders are just below full extension. Also during this phase, the knee will actually release, not actually flex again, or eccentrically flex after a slight extension to allow the bar to pass the knee joint and to prepare the body for the final extension phase. The velocity acceleration during this phase has picked up and changed significantly as the bar passes the knee joint. The bar will be picking up speed exponentially until the athlete reaches triple extension in the third phase. Phase 3 is the final extension phase or second pull phase of the clean. This stage is where the athlete will hit triple extension or maximal extension through the ankle, knees, and hips. 
With regard to range of motion during the third phase, the athlete must have achieved complete extension of almost every joint involved in the movement. This complete extension ensures pure energy transfer and will maximize the velocity and acceleration of the bar just before the fourth and final phase, the catch. With regards to acceleration of velocity, it too should be at an apex during the completion of phase three, the second pull, because of the complete extension of the joints involved in the movement. If the joints do not fully extend, you can be assured that the movement velocity will be greatly impacted and the likely suppressed. Observing the phase four or catch phase, the position is crucial to the completion of the power clean movement. The position of the elbows and mobility of the mid thoracic determine the placement of the center of gravity of the movement or the load and can cause the athlete to transfer too much weight towards the forefoot as opposed to being able to maintain the center of gravity over the hips through the center or heel of the foot. With regards to range of motion during the squat clean movement, the athlete must possess enough range of motion at the hip, glute, and ankle joint in order to effectively drop into a below 90 degree squat. This will allow enough eccentric absorption of the energy as well as aid by using the stretch shortening cycle of the athlete's knee joint for explosive concentric front squatting that will take place. In terms of velocity and acceleration during the catch phase of the power squat clean, it will reach maximum positive acceleration just before the catch is initiated and then reach maximum negative acceleration just before the catch is completed. Acceleration and velocity after the catch is completed is determined by the velocity or accelerating rate that the individual stands with after completing the catch. Moving on to observing the jerk press now, the first phase of the jerk is the dip. This is, like we talked about before, the quarter front squat looking motion. Here, the range of motion of the ankle, uh, as well as mid thoracic mobility, are crucial to maintaining a strong center of gravity and midline stabilization during the dip phase. Any deviation forward or backward during the eccentric dip segment could mean an altered bar path, which would result in decreased mechanical advantage during the drive phase to follow. The velocity and acceleration during the segment is completely controlled by the individual and is all negative acceleration and velocity until the drive phase when there will be a large change in direction of velocity. The next phase we'll observe is the dr drive phase of the jerk press. This is an incredibly explosive movement that requires absolute extension that the athlete can manage without deviating horizontally at either the knee, ankle, or hip joint. In terms of velocity and acceleration, the athlete will achieve most likely their greatest measure in both areas during this segment of the clean and jerk. The movement is a very explosive vertical explosion resulting in both a positive acceleration and velocity on the bar. The final phase we'll look at of the jerk phase is the catch phase. This position requires incredible flexibility through the mid thoracic in order to effectively stack the weight overhead. With poor mobility in the mid thoracic, the individual will likely have a poor bar path, which will eventually lead to a poor bar rack overhead, leading to the fact that the athlete cannot axial load the spine correctly, thus causing the athlete to miss the lift forward or backwards. In terms of velocity and acceleration, there's a large amount of negative acceleration that is then absorbed by the eccentric power of the athlete during the bottom phase of the split catch. Since we have just discussed what we would like to observe or proper technique during the clean and jerk, we should also discuss common errors that we would see uh, when some athletes are trying to achieve a perfect clean and jerk. Some of them would be hips rise before your shoulders, the bar slides away from the vertical shins during the first pull, extending the hips too early before they reach the power position, unable to maintain a stable midline during the catch, not dropping low enough in order to catch the barbell. Several of these are very common technique flaws. In addition to that, we have several coaching cues on how to get athletes out of those positions all of which are listed on the slide above.